Hi, everybody. Welcome to season two of the 7 and 7 show with Zach Ellison. This season, we're focused on bringing in the leading investors in innovation. And today I have with me Kelly Perdue. Kelly is the co-founder and managing general partner of Moonshots Capital. And Kelly, thanks for joining. Hey, I'm happy to be here, Zach. Thanks for having me on. So you've got an incredible background, incredibly diverse. You've done so many interesting things. I went to high school um, in a beautiful state that was not very populated called Wyoming. It definitely a flyover state. Um, and I got a nomination to West Point from the sole representative, since there's only one population-based representative, um, Dick Cheney, gave me my nomination to West Point. So I, I went off to West Point, um, north of New York City, about an hour. People don't know where that is. Um, and it's amazingly beautiful. Like, Phoenix, right on the Hudson River, um, and it's a phenomenal place to visit. And when people see it, it's like one of the most popular destinations for tourism in the United States. Um, however, in February, when you're standing in formation and the wind's whipping off the river, it's like 12 degrees. It's not as, it's not as scenic. Um, I spent four years at uh, West Point, got what I believe to be one of the best educations you can receive in the United States. Um, did some really fun stuff, like learned how to jump out of airplanes. Uh, I did a summer at something called cadet troop leadership training, uh, went over to the Fulda gap in Germany, replaced a platoon leader from the regular army who came back cause his, you know, for his wife was giving birth. And for six weeks, I was on the Fulda gap, you know, looking across at Soviets, looking back at us. Um, this is during, this is during, you know, college, right? Most people's college. Um, I spent a summer uh, in a program in D.C. working with the House Armed Services Committee. I had a top secret security clearance at the time, so I got to sit in on markup hearings. Um, really, truly had a really amazing experience as part of that, that four years at West Point. Uh, upon graduation, commissioned as a second lieutenant, uh, went in to serve active duty military in the Army to the 7th Infantry Division at Fort Ord. Uh, spent three years at Fort Ord before I was able to... Uh, take advantage of a program that they offered early outs to a few people in classes. They were doing base closures. Uh, President Clinton and crew were closing bases in the U.S. Um, and I went to law and business school at UCLA. I thought that program would offer me up kind of the most optionality on a go-forward basis and ended up kind of aligning myself and finding more in common with the business school crew it was in rather than the law school side. So finished law school, but never took a bar and started my first startup while I was still in that four-year JD MBA program. Uh, and that kind of entrepreneurial bug bit me hard and I never really looked back. So um, I've been a part of, you know, the founding team or senior executive team on 10 different companies. Some have been successful, some have been not so successful. I've got a lot of stories about, you know, um, not my, my credit card no longer working at Ralph's when I had my uh, shopping cart full of tuna and ramen um, and, you know, figuring out, okay, now what do I do? Um, the, the tough tales of an entrepreneur. Um, and then over the years started um, really engaging empathetically with my, you know, friends that were also founders. And as I became kind of older and more wizened and had a couple more bucks to spare, I would start investing as an angel first. Uh, and then with my co-founder in Moonshots Capital, Craig Cummings, who's also a West Point grad, um, we started, we founded Moonshots Capital and started investing as the lead of a syndicate in 2014. Uh, and then 2017, we started raising committed funds. So we raised and deployed a fund one, raised and deployed a fund two, and we're in the process of deploying out of fund three now. Um, our thesis is there are a lot of different technologies that evolve very quick, very quickly and quicker and quicker as we watch. Um, our thesis is that leadership wins at the end of the day. So we're looking for extraordinary leadership that can understand what's happening in the marketplace, pivot as required um, to really, you know, grow a business to massive scale. And so far it's going pretty well, knock on wood. In terms of um, leadership, obviously West Point grads are, are known to be great leaders and a lot of military veterans make excellent leaders. Um, do you guys have um, a mandate to invest in veterans or, or can you invest in, in any type of founder? 
So uh, we do not have a mandate that it has to be a military veteran. On our current about 200 million AUM, a little over a third of that is in companies that have a military veteran as part of the founding team. Uh, so we definitely lean in heavily when there's a military vet on the team. The, uh, the extraordinary leadership for us, like, you know, the reason military is, you know, near and dear and authentic to our backgrounds. Um, the only place in the world where millions of dollars is spent training you individually on leadership per se is the military, not just leadership, but how to train leadership. So, you know, Craig and I have been through that program, served active duty. Craig served 17 years active duty um, after graduation. Um, and uh, to us, um, the leadership traits that are kind of developed and honed in the military have direct application to the same kind of battlefield that is being an entrepreneur with an early stage tech company. Yeah, I, I love what veterans bring to to um, building startups in terms of intangibles and, and leadership, but but it's really uh, it's really the, the intangibles that impress me the most in terms of persistence and um, you know, commitment and the ability to you know, solve tough problems that other people might not be able to solve, but also be very adaptable. But what are some of the things that you that you think veterans bring to the equation that um, other founders don't, that don't have that type of background? Yeah, I mean, kind of two buckets. There's one, what you just described as intangibles. I actually think they're tangibles. Um, the, you know, training about integrity you know, it's, it's not an option. Like if you say you're at a grid, you better be at that grid or somebody could drop ordinance near where you're not and blow you up. Right. Um, and it's trained into you along the way, the attention to detail that's required to write an operations order, um, the flexibility, nimbleness that's required. Like in the U S military, a lot of people think, Oh, it's like, yes, sir. No, sir. Do whatever you're told. And you're kind of a drone. Um, Nothing could be further from the truth, right? So in you know, military, US military doctrine and training, it's like, okay, you company, Bravo, take that hill. It doesn't tell you how to take the hill. You've got to coordinate with the leaders on either side of you. And you've got to figure out the, with the resources that you have, which are usually not as much as you would like in a time frame you don't like. Not only do you have to take the hill, you've got to con frequently convince people to run into bullets. So when you compare the level of severity associated with doing that leadership challenge with, you know, figuring out how to get people to follow you around a vision, around building a company, you know, one of them is a lot harder than the other, I would say, right? So you've had really good practice at a lot of that stuff. The other thing that's really important that I'm not sure most investors are aware of or think about, but as a country, we trust, you know, our sons and daughters with these military leaders in combat. We trust them with their lives. And, you know, the officers and senior enlisted that are in charge of our sons and daughters in combat take that very, very seriously. Interestingly, the founders that are military veterans that we back, they treat other people's money the same way. It's like, this is amazing that someone's given me this opportunity and I'm going to treat this money as, you know, as if it were my own or maybe, maybe more carefully than if it were, were my own. So those are really important factors. Um, for, for us, um, it's, we're pretty heavily marketed that we do like and lean into military veterans. So you think about the ecosystem. Right now, say Techstars New York, say there's 15 companies in that cohort. You and I right now on a whiteboard could probably be 90% accurate on what sectors they're in, right? There's going to be an overabundance of AI right now. There's definitely healthcare. There's two or three fintech. I mean, we could walk through them and be pretty, pretty accurate. And for each one of those, there are literally hundreds of VC firms that focus on that sector specific. And so the cadre tech start is like, okay, pitch book, that analysis, here are the top 70 to go after for trying to get your next round of financing. But if one of those 15 companies in that cohort happen to have a former Navy SEAL or a fighter pilot or somebody on the team, they're going to go, you should talk to Kelly and Craig at Moonshot Capital. So it gets a little differentiated at that point. Next step is because of our network, I can back channel on that founder and that founder can back channel on Craig and I through 
the military connection is like, is this somebody you want in your foxhole or not? And you get pretty un, you know, unaudited feedback. It's like literally real feedback on somebody. And assuming that passes the test now, we start the VC entrepreneur dance about total addressable market. What is your unique selling proposition? What was the, you know, founding origin story on how you're, why you're, why you're solving for this problem. But what is critical is that background check and the same common shared, I don't know, serving something bigger than yourself is an instant bond. And if we end up liking each other and wanting to do the deal and leading the round, it's very possible that that, you know, military veteran founder trusts their lead investor as much or more as they trust their co-founder, right? To be in their corner to do the right thing. And that's really powerful when you start talking about how do we make really critical decisions? How do we make decisions quickly? And all the things that occur as the startup's growing. So it's for us, very compelling. You hit on some really key points there. And the, the point that I like the best is, is the integrity that's instilled in, in veterans. And uh, yeah, that's the most important thing. When you're investing in startups, you have to wonder, is this founder and is this team going to do what they say they're going to do? And the probability of them doing what they say they're going to do is much higher when they have you know, a background like you do and, and like the founders that you invest in do. So I think that's a key yeah, point. Part no, go ahead. Yeah, part of part of the um, the initial interactions and due diligence is also what we you know is critical from our from Craig's and my standpoint is something we call coachability. So, Craig and I have run startup companies before. We don't want to run the founders' company. That is not what we want to do, right? It's like Michael Corleone. Oh, they keep pulling me back in. We do not want to be pulled back in to run it. But we have learned a lot over the years, both as operators. And as investors, and we've many, many times kind of seen this movie before. So we want to know in this early engagement due diligence process, like part of what we check on is the coachability of that founder, right? They have to, you know, have very strong convictions kind of loosely held so that they can take feedback from us. Because if they can't ever even hear us, we want them to hear us and know that, hey, you know, I heard you, Kelly. I'm deciding to go this other direction for these reasons. I'm like, okay, it's you know, your decision. You're making a decision. I, I more probably than Craig reserve the right to say, I told you so. If something doesn't go the way it's supposed to, but at least we know that the feedback's getting through and that they're incorporating it into the process. Really important for us. And one of the things that um, I love about you know, military veterans is they're constantly trying to learn. Like it doesn't stop. There's this constant okay, what am I learning? How do I do it? What's happening on the battlefield? What's my competitor doing? And if you keep that up as a founder, any type of founder, wherever you're from, um, it's really going to be helpful for you. And the other thing you hit on that, that I think is key is the network connectivity. And what a lot of people kind of forget when it comes to early stage investing is that you're not just betting on the company, you're betting on what other investors will think of the company at later dates in the future. And so you could have a great company, but if the market for some reason doesn't love it, they're going to have a heck of a time raising capital or it's going to be very expensive to do so. And that could really crimp the business growth. And, and what I love about the veteran community, as you are already alluded to, is that when you call, they pick up the phone. If you're a veteran, you call another veteran, they, they not only pick up the phone, but they give you, you know, the inside information. They give you the, the good stuff that they might not tell everybody else because you already have uh, you know, bond of trust, right? And so that to me is critically important. And you, you don't see that with, with other groups of founders, right? It, it's very rare to be able to say, okay, I, I can get this information that nobody else can get and I can get access that nobody else can get unless they're in this group. And so I think that's incredibly important. Um, and then last thing I'll, I'll note is that some of the sectors that veterans tend to gravitate towards, I think are very investable. And you think of like cybersecurity and and a bunch of other applications that are called you know dual use technologies that might have you know government applications, uh, but they also have a lot of civilian applications. And so, just any thoughts on on dual use technologies before we dive into the broader themes? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, a big piece of our investment out of Fund Three is focused on dual use. And for people who don't know what dual use is. Um, and a business model 
an application, whatever the company's building has, has a, it, it's focused on both. It can be applicable to both the consumer market or commercial market, like the regular, you know, companies that are out there in the world. And then another part of it is DOD and or government, right? So and it, a, a good example of this would be IDME, right? So we've been invested in IDME since, since very, very early and it's online identity verification. And Blake Hall's a military veteran founder. Um, we've invested in Blake since inception. Um, the company's got about 113 million credentialed U.S. citizens. It allows them to access tax records, the treasury, uh, military veterans to access the VA, all online, increasing the capability of, uh, of the ability to identify who someone is. And those, those dual youth companies, as you said, frequently, especially with the DOD side and or the government side, that's like a whole nother language for somebody who's never lived in it or been there. And Craig's and my backgrounds, having been in the military and operated there for years, opens up that network to the founders who are focused on that sector. So anytime you can leverage that type of background, um, it's super helpful both to the founder and to winning deals if you're the if you're the entrepreneur that's going after you know a really hot deal with a great founder that's focused on that market. I think a lot of people don't realize that AI, as hot as it is, actually has you know its most powerful applications when it comes to the military. Uh, for the most, in my opinion, I mean, there's you know there's some well, very cool stuff going on with Chat GPT, but if you think about where this is headed, there's an arms race going on right now, but it's really around you know it's an AI race because whoever has the best AI is going to be very very hard to to compete against or or beat. What are your thoughts on that? I, I I believe that um, it's true. Nobody wants to be in second place when it comes to you know D their DOD side, right? You you don't want to you don't want to um, fall fall behind our adversaries, you know, particularly China. Um, I think that you know some of the existential fears that exist are also around this. They're they're, they're likely not around ChatGPT taking over, but they're around you know potential military applications where. If something goes wrong or the system tries to do something that it seems to be right, but a human would not do, that's where a lot of the fear components come in. But absolutely for um, everything from targeting, drone manipulation, you know, even, even think about, you know, joint management of a battlefield and how quickly a human thinks versus how fast the machine can move, um, solving things in ways that we haven't thought about before. There are many, many applications of AI, um, we have invested in one called Red Six that re recently raised a seventy million Series B. Dan Robinson, um, when we invested in him, wasn't a U.S. citizen yet; was the first non-U.S. citizen to fly an F twenty-two, and he is like Blake Hall of IDME, an epitome of the leadership style that we like to invest in. And a big problem in the United States is a lack of training capability for pilots. Resources are constrained, the price is incredibly high. We don't even have near peer aircraft that we can use to dogfight against, for instance, or you know, run simulations with. Um, and the, the, the initial target for Red 6 on what they wanted to uh, accomplish was to enable augmented reality in one of the most dynamic places on the planet, which is in the cockpit of a fighter jet. Uh, and they have successfully done that. So if I'm, you know, flying, you know, my my F-22 in a training, you know, and I'm up in my, you know, one mile by one mile cubed airspace, I can look out through my visor in my helmet and see an ally maybe from France or wherever in their airspace. But it looks like, you know, they're in their one mile, one mile cube over over France and we can simulate working together. I can see surface to air missiles coming at me. I can practice refueling all without having any of those other things there. So it's a pretty spectacular use case um, that Red Six is solving for, and it has a lot of downstream uh, ramifications for the entire battlefield. So before we dive into the, the broader uh, VC landscape, I have to ask you, how did you get on to The Apprentice? Because you actually won <laughs> season two of The Apprentice and I'm just curious yeah. how that came to be. Um, so I, I went, as I said, to business school at UCLA. It's called Anderson. And my uh, next youngest brother also had gone to business school there. 
and Mark Burnett, who is the producer of The Apprentice, um, in addition to the mail your application in online, the uh, city by city tour that they did to have Donald or Ivanka or somebody come and then everybody would walk through and try to interview to try to get a slot on the show. Um, Mark Burnett ran closed casting calls at the business schools in Los Angeles. So this email went out to alumni that said, hey, if you want to try out for the, you know, the apprentice, there'll be a closed casting call at the school, whatever. So I, um, I was like, yeah, that's silly. I'm not going to do that. Delete. And my brother forwarded it to me, the same email, and said, you have to go do this. That show was made for you. And I'm like, oh, all right. So I went, acted the fool during, you know, there were, you know, 300 guys and ties in the, you know, auditorium at Anderson filling out forms. So I acted silly. They broke us into groups of 10 and, you know, asked us questions in front of people. And I acted silly a little bit and aggressive. And the casting agent said, hey, you know, you know, pulled, tugged on my sleeve jacket and said, hey, come here, come here afterward. And we want to do a follow up interview with you. So they sat me in a room for, an hour with the Sony beta cam and two people asking me questions about all parts of my life and everything. And that went well. I made it to the final 50 and they did a really interesting, you know, analysis of us, you know, everything about our minds, our intellect, our predispositions and everything else. And I got down selected to the final 18. A week later, I'm flying to New York and they take all of our logos and our wallet with our info and our money and everything else. And you're given, you know, a task every three days that you have to go perform with a group of people where I think Burnett probably uh, picked three or four people that could be the winners and the rest were a psycho demographic of the U S to try to make it entertaining, which he did very, did a very good job of. And we went at it for about six weeks and uh, the finale was live. So at the end of six weeks, I'm in the you know final boardroom against my nemesis. And uh, they go, okay, that's it, everybody. Come back in December, like five months later, six, six months later, and have to be quiet for six months about where I was, what I was doing, you know, under threat of, you know, everything that I ever owned and my firstborn, you know, go to, go to Burnett. And uh, the show aired, and then obviously everybody knew where I had been and what happened. And then as the season progressed, it was, you know, edited to what it was edited. And the finale was at the Lincoln Center in New York, and Regis Philbin was the MC and they had the band playing money, money, money and three hour finale. And I won. That's amazing. So who, who would have thunk it? Who would have thunk <laughs> it? You never know until you try, right? I mean, yeah. that's cool. So how did that, what did you learn from that? Actually, what, what were your big takeaways looking back on it now? I mean, the, the actual, you know, show there were there was a lot of strategy to the show there were about three levels of game play going on during the entire time um you know remember i had been in the military you know airborne ranger qualified i'd been through law school so i i think i was one of the oldest contestants i was like 38 maybe when i went on the show and um and it was back to back to back like it's the the, the audience on tv sees every week like there's a new episode like they, everybody's a bit gone about their lives had you know slept played done whatever and watch it next thursday well when we were filming that would cost a lot of money to keep us all occupied for that time so literally it's back to back plus it gets more fun because everybody gets more tired and starts making mistakes and there's no sleep and everything else so we're crammed in this little like apartment like studio thing where the beds aren't quite long enough you're filmed everywhere except in the head and this, the sound is on at all times. So there's no alone time. There's nothing. And there's very little sleep and there's high stress and people are being sent to the boardroom and fired kind of eat on your own. So I'm like, Oh, this is kind of better. This is way better than ranger school. It's like back and or Kelly <laughs> c- civilians are dying. And the, you know, the women are trying to get, the, you know, there's no like makeup artist for any of this. And they know they're going on, you know, 10 to 20, 30 million people watching them every night. So it's like this trying to put your makeup on and get your hair right and do everything else on top of all the stress from. So it was a, uh, to say the least, a very interesting exercise. And it it was kind of, I mean, it was kind of easy from a process standpoint for me. The tasks were difficult. There were different challenges. But what I watched was 
it's, you know, it's not like Survivor. Like if you're by far the strongest person on Survivor, you get voted off immediately because you're a threat. Trump act like a backstop for that because if there were people starting to gang up on a strong player, they were just as likely to be fired for doing that as, they, as somebody was for losing the task. So everybody kind of had to play straight and you just had to perform. So it was one of those kind of, I don't know, strangely enough, significant. It was very meritoc- very much a meritocracy as you, as you were evolving through the show. I'm not saying there weren't some politics in play and it's different stuff that happened in the suite that kept people on their toes differently. But like, it was literally like, you know, if you'd asked that crew, it was, you know, I think everybody would have probably voted the final four as the final four internally. And then it was, you know, up for anyone's grab. But I, I, I did learn a lot working with Donald in New York for the year after the show. Um, his ability to manage slash manipulate the media was amazing. Like if you'll remember out of the blue, he would like, I can't remember. He would say something about Rosie O'Donnell or Martha Stewart or something. All of those were explicitly timed in like two to three weeks before the next season of the apprentice would start to get the whirlwind effect going on everything that was happening. Um, His, you know, kind of you know not kind of he's a deal junkie right he doesn't drink he doesn't smoke he doesn't gamble he loves the deal so any given time between like 6 a.m and 10 p.m there's like eight to ten people different deals waiting to go into his office two or three assistants doors open you can hear him negotiating different points in front of they'll have two people two different buildings negotiating in front of each other different deals and the you know the line is moving. You can see the line moving, right? Hey, get me a tiger. Let's play, a, you know, d- d- you know, d- down in Florida, like next week. Like what? It, it's just constant, right? And uh, it was it was amazing to see and understand of what he did with those deals and using the media to impact them. And I learned, you know, that you better be using the media as a as the founder for your company for your brand, or your competitor will be. Right. It, it will happen. So you need to understand it. You need to be using it because it makes you, you know, fight way above your weight class and whatever you're doing. And then my my business partner, Craig Cummings, calls that apprentice kind of the gift that keeps on giving. Because remember, this was 2005. Right. This is, you know, I would actually met Craig. He finished his Ph.D. at Columbia to go back and teach at West Point when the dean, because of the spike in applications leading up through the finale of The Apprentice, said, hey, Kelly, I think you've done so much more for the military out of it than you ever could have in it. And I was like, I think that was a compliment. But I, I got to go back to speak to cadets and faculty. And I met Craig on the, you know, that he, get, he drew the short straw to be my handler for that trip. And that's where we met and eventually became business partners. So I learned, I learned a lot about that, you know, year watching Donald Trump operate. Um, just, you know, I, I asked him, I said, you know, what is the leadership trait? Because I wrote a book called Take Command. It was 10 leadership principles I learned in the military and put to work for Donald Trump. He wrote the foreword. Um, I was like, well, what leadership trait would you consider to be the most important leadership trait when you're hiring? Remember, you know, this is a guy who used, uh, you know, a 20 year bodyguard to be the lead for tr- the Trump Hotel and Resort in Vegas, the lead real estate person. That's a bodyguard trait, like for. T- and, he, and, you know, not surprisingly, he said loyalty. But I thought it was fascinating that that's how, he, you know, that's how he operated. What he I'm like, what about like super high IQ or, you know, you know, maybe knowledge of the law or what, you know, whatever it is. He's like, no, loyalty is the most important thing. You can't, you know, you can't replace it. You can't do anything without it. And that was interesting to hear him say that. So I've, I've been approached so many times over the years from all sides, you know, trying to get dirt, trying to get this, trying to, and I, and I'm. You know, he was, he, he was great to me. I'm one of the, probably the few people that didn't get fired ever. <laughs> so it's uh it, it was a really great experience for me. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. You know, I think about it a lot in terms of Trump's ability to, to market and whether, you know, whether people agree with, with, with his policies or not, or, or the way he acts. Uh, when we talk about his marketing, I would say he, he he might be the best marketer of all time. Uh, I mean, in my view, I mean, it's hard to find somebody who's better. Uh, when I think of like individual 
brand building, the ability to, to develop a following. I mean, I've never seen anyone better in my lifetime. There, you know, there's some people throughout history, I'm sure, but um, very few it, that come close. It, it, it actually has a number on it. Like um, this is a while ago, so I don't know what's transpired since, you know, I don't, I probably hasn't heard him, you know, being president of the United States, but prior to that, um, people would come to him with real estate development projects wanting to put Trump's name on it, right? Like, uh, we, you know, and the, the only reason anybody would want to do that is to increase the value. And the, va the average value increase from putting the Trump brand on it, plus some QA, like some quality control of like, and I think some, you know, shiny gold and black stuff in the lobbies and stuff, but like superficial, like not, not massive or significant, you know, cost changes is over 50% increase in value. So there are enough people who associate Trump with success that it literally changes the value of a piece of property by only putting the name on it. So it's from a brand building standpoint, it's pretty unbelievable. You know, it's, it's interesting because that actually feeds into one of the things that I want to talk to you about today on the VC side. Which, and uh, I'll just bring it up now because we're, we're talking about it. But I feel like when a good investor who's got a very strong brand invests in a company, it immediately increases the value of that company and almost exponentially increases their probability of success because it opens up you know, so much visibility and much more connectivity to, to resources, whether it's capital or other resources. So it's just something I think a lot about in terms of people always talk about product, but I think what we're seeing is there's, there's a, there's a lot of value that's derived from the brand and the marketing around products, you know, almost as more so than, than the product itself. I mean, I mean, it's a danger in that too, right? In the sense that if there's a lot of hype, right? We saw that, with, we've seen that a lot over the last couple of years where there's a lot of hype and most of it has, has not materialized. But I do think that if you build a reputation like you have at Moonshots as being a very good investor, you know, with access to a lot of resources and a lot of, you know, deep experience in the space, uh, it actually attracts better investment opportunities for you because companies know that when you invest in them, it's going to increase their value and increase their probability of success. So I think the key part of what, thank you for saying that, but I, I think the key part of what you said is reputation. And it's, it's years of work doing things a certain way that develop that reputation that with a few maybe even one major error you can completely screw up. But that reputation piece is, is incredibly important and something that, um, you know, every deal that we invest in is highly competitive. And Craig and I believe that a differentiator on how we operate is the level to which we engage with the founder. Like we're early stage, right? So we're, you know, seed round. So it's like an ID me when I joined the board in 2011. That's 12 years that I've been like this with Blake, right? So it's, it's, it's a marriage when we engage, right? And we don't have a, for lack of a better term, a spray and pray strategy where we fire 250K into a whole bunch of deals and hope one of them turns into Google. That is not how we attack it, right? We're what we call investing with conviction and then kind of pooling our resources behind those companies that we invest in with conviction so that we do Hopefully, like it looks like we have a great track record. Is that because we're good pickers or is that because we're good helpers after we invest? So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy is what kind of what you just described. And I think it's a little bit of both. I do believe that we get to see better deals over time because we're in flow, because our co-investors like that we don't have sharp elbows and try weird stuff during deals. We do what we say we're going to do and we add significant value in a lot of different areas. And we do that continuously. And so when we're in a very competitive situation where we want to like lead around, if we can get the founder to do the correct due diligence, and it's a good, it's a good, it's a good to know if they're not like, if we can get them to talk to four or five of our founders, whichever ones they want, like we'll give them two or three, but go find four or five. We win the deal. If they do that due diligence, we get, we get to lead the deal. Um, and I think that is exactly what you just described, but it, it's really the 
10 to 20 years that comes before you have the reputation where you make that valuable. I always love the expression, it takes years to become an overnight success. You know, <laughs> yeah. I've got so many examples that I could bring up, but you know, it's, it's funny when people ask me, like, how do you develop credibility? You know, I've had a lot of employees that have worked for me that have said, like, Zach, how do I build credibility? How do I become relevant? I tell them, really, it's about being a really hard worker and delivering consistently over a long period of time. And, and there really are no shortcuts. You know, I remember one time I was in the gym. This is a, an anecdote. Um, this is you know, probably five, 10 years ago. And a, a, I, was, I was you know on the bench press or something. And I, was, I was putting up pretty big weights back in those days. And, and this college kid came up to me. I think he was in college, a young guy. He said, you know, I would, I would love to be able to you know, you know, be able to lift that much one day. Like, you know, how do I do it? I said, I'll give you the plan. And then I'll see you in 10 years, right? That was, right. I mean, that's how you do it. You know, it, it's going to take you, you know, 10 years of, of working out, you know, five days a week, and then you'll do it too. So it's achievable. Right. In fact, I can give you the plan that will almost guarantee that you'll get to this level, but it's a hell of a lot of work. And most people, when they hear that, don't want to put in the work, right? If you tell them, hey. You know, Absolutely. And people have asked me, why do you, you know, why have you gotten you know, so many degrees? You know, what? You have an MBA from Chicago. You have a master's in risk from NYU. You're getting a doctorate from University of Florida. You're a CFA charter holder. You're a CHIA charter holder. Like, what are you like insecure? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I'm insecure in the sense that I never want. I'm a workhorse. Poor. I never want to be poor. Yeah. Like when I was growing up, I had no money, and so I said, I'm going to work my ass off so that I will always have fallback options, and I'll never stop working. And you know, it takes a lot of people time to you know, to uh, recognize that. But over time, the, the people I do business with now are people that I've known for years or that who have seen me work so hard for so long. And so I, I have credibility with them because they know nobody works harder than Zach, right? And, you know, I'll make mistakes at times, of course, like everybody does, but nobody's going to outwork me, right? And I'm probably on average going to make better decisions because I've gotten so many reps in over the years. Yep. Learn from my you've mistakes. Collected more, you've collect, collected more data. You've got more scar tissue. You, exactly. Your gut, your gut is smarter, yep. right? That, that, is, that is really important um, when you're, when you're decision-making because um, you, you can't, and, and this is something from our, you know, as we've invested in companies and 112 companies now, um, you know, our advice to these founders um, as they're thinking about an outside board member or the next round of financing and which of the partners they want to be on, you know, hopefully they can push for another one partner or another based on things. Operating experience for us is absolutely critical, right? The only way that somebody has actual empathy for what you're going through is if they have been in the seat before. Um, you can read case study and you can become very smart as an investor over time watching what transpires but it's, there's still a disconnect of full empathy and that empathy helps breed a lot of trust, which is, as we said, like super important for between the founder and the, and the board members. You know, I think that in the long run, that's going to be what sets ARI apart in the venture debt space in the sense that I'm a founder. You know, I built this from scratch. It was just an idea in my head and every single detail of the business I've, I've built essentially, or been a part of building. And with that comes the trials and tribulations of every founder, right? Like everything Absolutely. that every founder is going through, like I've gone through it too. Like I've built this from nothing, yep. I've raised capital. I know how hard it is to raise capital, not only operate <laughs> capital, but go try raising you know, a couple hundred million dollars of capital for a fund. I mean, you know, you've done it too. Yep. But yeah, most, you know, almost every other you know competitor of ours, I use that word lightly. I don't really think of competitors. I think the space is big enough for everybody and we've all got our own niches. But others in the space don't have that experience for the most part. Like you go to you know, a, a bank, you're dealing with a 28-year-old you know, VP who, who doesn't give a shit, quite frankly, right? They're going to be off to something, other, something different in two years. They have no experience. They, they have no idea what it's like to, to be a founder. They have no idea what you're going through mentally or what you're going to need to go through to actually build that business because they've never done it. You know, like I think about like the 20, you know, seven year old version of me, you know, 15 years ago. Yeah. At like, ah. Bank. 
Yeah, like I was a smart guy. I was at Scotia Bank. I was managing a multi-billion dollar loan portfolio during the credit crisis. I had no losses, but I knew shit then compared to what I know now. Yeah. And it's not even close, yeah. right? And what I knew then would not have been enough to be a successful uh, fund builder or entrepreneur or investor, quite frankly, at the level that I'm at now. So it's it's just, um, yeah, I think, I think being somebody who's been an operator and been a company builder is incredibly important in in this you know in this ecosystem i mean if, if you don't have those you know credentials i think you you don't really have the credibility in my view yeah but, the, the if you yeah without the experience you're you're providing some advice that's questionable about what it's based on um and it's just not as helpful um it's harder to develop the trust so there, there are some great investors that i've worked with who don't have a lot, lot of operating experience um, and they've learned it and listened and understood and watched and incredibly smart. Um, and there are other ways to help. It's not every single decision that has to be, you know, life or death on whether or not you've operated. There are, especially as companies grow, you know, in the series B, C, D, I think, you know, experience with exotic structures on debt. Like this is something that, you know, you don't have to have been an operator to understand where to go for that and how to get it. When you start thinking about, you know, the most talented teams that exist to take companies public, what the banking process like for the roadshow. These are all things that are very important, but aren't necessarily grounded in, oh, I've, I've been an operator before. So um, as the company evolves, I'm less strict feeling about that, that advice, but early on, absolutely critical.